bless you on such a beautiful day. Um, upcoming events. What's going on this week? A lot of us are going to be out of commission because we're going to Berlin for a round well, table, which is going to be very, very exciting. Um, so uh, that's happening on Friday. So we'll have some stories, no doubt, to, <laughs> to bring back next week. So you'll, you'll see some of us gone on Wednesday as a result just because of travel. Um, but this is, a, this is a fantastic week again for the Cloak and Research Series. I'm trying to think of any upcoming events, Angie or Gustavo, that we wanted to highlight. We just talked about so many program lectures and the Ocean Memorial Lecture coming up, but that's not for a few no, weeks still. So I think we're okay otherwise. Um, so no, I think James, um, Tatiana, we're so excited for this. I'm sorry that you weren't able to make it, but we're, we're thrilled to still be able to do it virtually. So thanks for making the time. and. Please, James, I can't think of anything else pressing right now, so <laughs> go for it. If you don't know me, and I'll be facilitating the conversation today, um, but I want to introduce uh, Professor Tatiana Receba. She's at Appalachian State, um, but I'll say she's, a, she's an IU alum from, was it 2010, you said? Uh, so it's, it's been a while, but uh, you're here you, you were here at the workshop. You worked with Bernie. You were working with Lynn and uh, Mike and others, but um, welcome back, and again, I'm sorry that you couldn't be here. Uh, but I understand and glad that uh, you, could, you could be on Zoom, uh, but, but you're now in um, the Department of Government and, and Justice Studies, and you're quite involved uh, at Appalachian State um, and in the region with the Appalachian Carbon Research Group and affiliated faculty of the Research Institute for the Environment, Energy, and Economics um, at App State, and then obviously here at the Ocean Workshop, your affiliated faculty. So uh, really excited about your talk today uh, on this on this new paper that you, you've been putting together uh, entitled Evaluating Forest Carbon Governance in a Subnational Climate Mitigation System Using the Network of Action Situations Approach. Um, so again, we'll start off with a 20, about a 20 minute presentation, then we'll have 40 minutes for Q&A and I'll uh, navigate between our, our online attendees and, and the folks here in the room. So uh, if, um, if I don't see your hand, uh, throw something at me, please. Um, <laughs> otherwise, uh, Tatiana, I'll turn it over to you and it's, it's great to be uh, reading one of your papers again. Thank you, James, for the introduction. Um, this was very generous of you, and uh, I'm happy to be here and sharing my work with you today about forest carbon governance, evaluating carbon governance using the networks of action situations approach, as you just mentioned. Is everything good on your end? Can you see the title slide? Yeah, everything looks good, and uh, your voice is nice and clear on this end. Perfect. Thank you. So I'll just uh, jump right into this and start by saying that last year, 2021 was pivotal for global carbon markets uh, with the volume of car traded carbon offsets reaching a new high point. And um, that's not the most important thing, however, since uh, the climate talks in Glasgow last November finalized the rules under um, Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. And that um, rule actually promises to enable linkages among voluntary and compliance carbon markets. Um, and here domestically, right, Washington State passed legislation uh, last November, uh, last May um, 2021 to launch a cap and invest emissions trading program by 2023. Oregon authorized use of forest offsets and Pennsylvania joined the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, RGGI, and all of that happening at the backdrop of evolving policies on the California's Carbon Offset Program, which is the oldest such program and the largest subnational carbon crediting mechanism in the world. And so I would argue here that California's program is a good case to look at if we want to understand the governance of forest um, offsets or carbon offsets more generally. So briefly about California's program, uh, since 2013, the state has authorized the use of offsets from the forest sector as compliance instruments in a statewide cap and trade system. And under that system, regulated entities here to the uh, right compensate other parties for forest management activities that maintain or enhance carbon sinks in exchange for a standardized credit or an offset that would satisfy uh, their mitigation obligation. Um, so what is an offset? Um, there's a definition here, but basically it's an intangible asset. It's also a complex good. It is a you know, 
it has characteristics of, of public and private goods, but I'll call it a complex good here. And it's production dynamics are guided by the California Forest Offset Protocol as the main institutional framework. So taken as a whole, California system, I, I would argue, reflects aspects of polycentricity, um, such as multiple jurisdictions and rule governed interactions, but also standards of accountability and environmental integrity. So I approached, began to study quite uh, you know, a few years back. Um, and these were the two questions that informed the study. What characteristics of that system encourage or discourage participation in the offset program, California's offset program? in which interactions inform participation and the supply of forest offsets. So why talk about carbon offsets? I'm sure that this is uh, a topic that you are somewhat familiar with and, and you well know that they're both advocates and critics of offsets. So briefly here, one argument out there is that financing via offset projects is critical for catalyzing faster climate action particularly if we're serious about reducing emissions in the near term, right, uh, and acting fast. Um, but the integrity of offsets matters, right? And we want offsets that represent permanent, reliable, but also additional carbon storage. Uh, critics, on the other hand, would question the degree to which offsets reflect real climate benefits. Uh, there's a paper that just came out in Global Change Biology titled Systematic Overcrediting in California's Carbon Offset Program. And the authors look at, I think, a subset of forest management projects and find that substantial ecological, substantial ecological and statistical shortcomings in the design of the California protocol generate offset credits that do not reflect climate benefits. And their results further illustrate that protocol designs with easily exploitable rules can undermine policy objectives, therefore highlighting the need for stronger governance in carbon offset markets. So, I mean, carbon markets are imperfect and so are offsets. And, and I, I have to be outright about that. Um, but if we want to understand markets, and I'll borrow here an analogy from a recent report titled The Anatomy of the Carbon Market, we can better understand markets as living organisms, right? Um, and uh, focus on three components, right? The rules and policies that just like the nerve center of a system sends signals to the rest of the body, we can look at connective tissues or tissue in terms of the market participants or actors, and then a set of health measures, right? By which we can assess the state of the market, such as accountability, integrity, and participation. And participation here in particular is what I'm interested in when I'm looking at California's market. Um, and so just to give you some context about that market, as of um, this year, as of August of this year, forest offsets collectively represented 82% of all offsets issued by the California Air Resources Board or CARB, I'll use that abbreviation. This is the agency that oversees the program and that interacts with a range of actors from forest owners to developers, project developers, registries, the regulated industry, professional foresters, verifiers, financiers, brokers, etc. cetera. Um, and as of uh, last summer, um, there have been a total of 148 forest projects that are earning credits on the California's program with a third of these projects based in California and some regional concentrations here in the Southeast and Northeast United States. Um, and there haven't been there hasn't there hasn't been any new forest offset projects since last year, as I've been monitoring them. And partly that might be explained by the fact that last January, um, CARB adopted a new rule that requires forest offset projects to demonstrate direct environmental benefits 
to the state of California known as the DEBS requirement. And that basically prioritizes projects that are based in the state of California. All right, common participants in these projects are typically forest industry, institutional investors and uh, land conservancies. And you can see some of the motivations uh, that have been mentioned in terms of why they're developing these projects. Um, with industry here and land trusts being the top offset producers in terms of the number of credits issued. Private forest owners, on the other hand, are substantially underrepresented. Most of these uh, they have just four projects, but they have been predominantly pilot projects. This is despite the fact that half of forest land in the United States is privately owned. And among or within that group of forest owners, there's roughly, um, there are roughly about, there are 9.6, but roughly 10 million families uh, or family forest owners who hold a third of the forest land in the United States that accounts for 39% of, of above ground forest carbon storage. And this comes from estimates, US Forest Service estimates from the forest inventory analysis. So there is a substantial percentage of land that is held by these individuals and families. So it is important, right, to understand the characteristics that shape participation by private forest owners and what or which interactions among related decisions inform participation in the supply of offsets, my two questions. Um, and to approach these questions, to address them, I adopted the network of action situations approach as a diagnostic tool um, to identify connections among decisions that pertain to the transformation of a public good, carbon sequestration into tradable credits. Um, so the NAS approach, I'll use the abbreviation NAS or Networks of Action Situations is an extension of the IID. And it's first, it was first formulated formally by Mike McGuinness in his 2011 paper. And you can see that this approach has been gaining popularity by the graph shown here to the right that comes from a recent review of the empirical literature led by um, Christian Kimmich and a number of other colleagues. Um, so the NAS approach typically posits that we can better understand dynamics, but also outcomes in complex systems by identifying a set of action situations um, as these flowcharts here illustrate and the connections among these situations where actors interact and make decisions. So in particular, at the very bottom left, this is a flowchart of the network of action situations in marine fisheries that comes from Mike McGinnis 2011 article, denoting these connections among action situations by the arrows representing uh, flows of information and resources and rules. All right, so how do we analyze a network of action situations? Typically that process begins by identifying a focal action situation by right, the core unit of analysis under the IAG and its components, right, actors, positions, actions, et cetera. And examining how that focal action situation is influenced by other action situations. So in this analysis, I approach the identification of action situations by looking at key activities that are part of the supply of forest offsets and really borrowing from the literature on local public economies that came out of Lynn and Vincent's work on policing um, in, in metropolitan areas. So I identified five action situations with the first one being the focal action situation provision production and financing of offset projects. The second one, verification, registration and issuance, monitoring and sanctioning, marketing and sale as the fourth action situation. And finally, rulemaking and dispute resolution with the fifth one being a collective choice action situation and the first four um, at the operational uh, level. Uh, conceptualized at the operational level. So 
So zooming in on the FALCO action situation here that involves the provision and production and financing of offset, uh, of, of forest offsets, there are a set of contextual factors, right, um, that would influence those decisions, including the forest conditions, the social context, but also a set of complex methodologies for carbon quantification. The outcome of that first situation is the listing of the project with an approved carbon registry. So when that outcome becomes actually an input to another action situation, action situation two, by affecting one or more of its contextual factors, then we can argue or say that the two situation, situations, action situation one and situation two are related and therefore here the, the lines represented by the red line institutional link and the green um, link, uh, actor link, these two links would uh, generate a set of simultaneous or sequentially linked, simultaneously or sequentially linked action situations or a network of action situations. So, so this is basically the strategy that I use to disaggregate the system into a series, the five um, action situations that I shared, um, and then look at how the connections among, among them via rules and actors combine to affect and shape participation um, as well as offset supply. Methodologically, the approach that I used involves qualitative content analysis, process tracing, and document analysis, drawing on a variety of sources including three versions of the California Air Resources Board protocol from 2011 up to 2015, interviews, project documentation, and insights from the empirical literature. To identify the characteristics that shape participation, I mapped the five action situations, compiled the data for each situation and its components, and then synthesized the connections via rules and actors. And so that led to a detailed table, and I'm not going to walk you through all of that. I'll just zoom in here on uh, the actors. The table lists each action situation, its components, and the types of rules that influence those components. Looking just at the focal action situation, we see landowners and developers and professional foresters making decisions about the design and development of the project, leading to the outcome uh, of the situation, which is project listing, as mentioned, and an estimated volume of carbon offsets. Another thing to point out here in terms of actors is that there's a prevalence of experts. In addition to developers, we have verifiers, brokers, carbon registries, et cetera. I also considered the positions that actors take uh, or assume in terms of principal agent relationships, for example, an equity sharing contract between the, a landowner, a forest owner, and a carbon developer in the FALCO action situation that is important for developing the project and really financing the project. And while there is only one contractual arrangement in the FALCO situation, there are up to six such relationships in the second, third, and fifth action situation. So just to unpack these relationships, uh, there's, there are a total of 10 principal agent relationships that I find across the five situations. And uh, notably here, landowners and uh, CARB are the primary principal of the contract with a variety of experts um, in, in various action situations. Um, part one, the principal agent relationship one, as I mentioned, is present in all action situations creating linkages among, among those situations. But more importantly here, there are problems with principal agent relationships that we're well familiar with, including information asymmetry and adverse selection. And so arguably here, the presence of multiple such relationships can compound those dynamics, um, enable opportunistic behavior, and therefore lead to non-additional non -additional offsets. Um, another implication could be that uh, multiple actor overlapping principal agent relationships may increase coordination issues and transaction as well as financial costs for participants. 
In terms of the second question, which interactions among situations inform participation? I evaluated those connections via actors and institutions. Uh, again, actors, uh, actor linkages operationalized as principal agent relationships and institutional or rule-based links derived from the protocol and registry rules, and then looked at their effect or assessed their effect by the valuation of current and future payoffs, which led to a pretty detailed flowchart or, or visual summary of network interactions that I'm going to zoom in on next. Um, and this is an attempt to summarize the interactions in the network with arrows here representing actor, um, actor and uh, institutional rule-based linkages. And all, all of the action situations, except for the first, the focal action situation, are dynamic or repetitive interactions. So what I'll focus on here is, is the links or arrows that flow uh, into the Falco action situation one, which help us understand um, participation, right? They explain the behavior in the Falco action situation. So starting off with the uh, collective choice action situation five, the outcome of it uh, is protocol rules, and in particular, protocol rules about project additionality and the risk assessment have a direct impact on the expected uh, both quantity and quality of offset credits that are part of the project listing and therefore would affect the project's revenue. Um, and so that expected volume of offsets is really determined by a baseline performance standard that, that says, uh, that, that separates project activities into those that are eligible for credits additional and those that are not or non-additional credits. In terms of the influence from action situation two, there are arrows in both directions, but just looking at the one that flows into the FOCO, the um, failure to undergo or even pass verification may trigger project delisting or termination. And certainly some of the interviews talk about discretionary decisions and rule interpretation by carbon registries during the registration process. And that introduces additional uncertainty that, that uh, has been described, uncertainty in terms of the project development that has been described as compliance with a moving target, hence influencing outcomes in the focal situation. And the final connection here, the outcome of the third action situation is offset permanence, um, which can impose uh, significant long-term costs in terms of the monitoring, reporting, and verification obligations that come with it, um, and could shape participation, obviously. Um, what permanence means is that the carbon that's represented by an offset must remain stored for 100 years under the California protocol, and that's 100 years following the last credit issuance. And typically the issuance, the credit issuance period is 25 years. So we could be looking at a 125 uh, year period. Um, and so those projects must be maintained and must undergo periodic monitoring, uh, reporting and verification for 100 years. Um, so what, what we heard uh, from a developer is that in almost no cases, could a, a landowner front the development costs on their own? The development costs are significant. The long-term costs are significant and the uncertainty regarding the program can be significant. So costs in general have uh, been cited as a significant deterrent uh, in the empirical literature as well, um, but they can be a particular barrier for small-scale private forest owners Costs do vary, some are periodic, um, some are annual, um, and they scale up or scale down, down depending on the project size. And in explaining their decision to delist a project, um, a developer said the verification cost for this 200 acre project was nearly the same as for projects of several thousand acres. Uh, John, this is James here. Um, I, while you're taking a drink, um, in order to have enough time for Q and A, you think maybe two more minutes, you could wrap it wrap it Perfect. up. Perfect. Sweet. Yep. Thank I'll, you. I will do that. Um, I'll just sum up by saying that institutional linkages illustrate interdependencies in terms of multiple contracts that raise costs, and that this, these observations are somewhat consistent 
with um, agency theory predictions about outcome-based contracts. And I'll skip here the details. There are some systematic patterns in terms of the reliance on technical, uh, technically complex rules and experts. These trends are consistent with what we see in the sustainability governance literature. And there's some, um, uh, some power inequities or dynamics in terms of available resources and capital in uh, project scale or ownership scale. In terms of the institutional linkages, what we see is, um, and here institutional linkages in terms of the offset protocol, we see a significant uh, role for the collective choice rules and by extension, the role of the state. Um, the changing protocol rules also suggest trade-offs in terms of offset integrity being prioritized over broader participation, again, highlighting some of the power dynamics. And this suggests that protocols along with their carbon accounting methodologies could be potential levers for reform. Um, I do have some notes about the NAS approach in terms of limitations and prospects, but I think I'll stop here. Maybe those would be, would come up during the, the um, discussion. Well, thank you very much for that. Um... Be happy to volunteer. Oh yeah, we, we got a line of questions here, so I, I'm, I'm not even going to get to start with mine. Uh, so we'll, we'll start with Mike, and then we'll wrap around the room. You can collect the list, sort of what's going on. Tatiana, it's great to see you again. It's been a long time. Uh, you've done a really, really good job of of implementing this um, uh, uh, NAS uh, uh, framework that that I set up. Geez, over ten years ago now. Uh, and you kind of are confronting the same problem I, and I think everyone else has used it. Once you go through and fill out all the major actors and the major action situations and the connections, then what the hell are you gonna do with it? Uh, you know, there's just a lot of information in there uh, and you've done a really good job of, of laying that out. And so now I think the, the question is sort of how you moving forward. And I'm kind of curious as to what direction you see yourself going in. Uh, do you see this as primarily uh, a basis for some research projects for uh, the questions such as uh, uh, you mentioned in that most recent article that the recent article that came out on the uh, uh, the systematic over crediting. Do you see yourself sort of contributing to that literature or more sort of the market creation or mechanism design question, more of a policy oriented question of uh, if this is a big problem for the small producers to uh, small owners to get in. Can there be subsidies? Can they work together in a cooperative? Uh, are there are there ways to sort of you know combine the costs in some way? Uh, so do you see this more as sort of a research or a a, a policy oriented kind of project that you're moving towards? I'll say both, but thank you, thank you first of all for um, for being here and for the comments. And I just saw that there's a an email from you in my mailbox that I can't wait to read. Um, <laughs> And, and and yes, you're right. There's a lot in terms of what's next, and and really synthesizing the results um, in a way that have some uh, that can resonate with policymakers. Um, mm -hmm. And you're right. There are developments out there, and that was one of the points I wanted to mention in the concluding slide. Um, there is policy learning and diffusion that's happening outside of California. And that these private entities like the American Forest Foundation and the Nature Conservancy that just launched a new program that's called the Family Forest Carbon Program. And it targets small scale 40 acres or above uh, forest owners. And it has a different approach than that in California, uh, which is practice based, right? The idea that as long as these practices are implemented, and it's more like a behavior type of contract opposed to the outcome-based contract on the California system. And so it will be interesting to compare them. I think that will be a, a, new, a new direction that I'd like to go um, that, that really has more policy relevance, but also links to theory. Mm. And there's more to that, but I'll, I'll just stop here. I mean, one, one additional point really is about linkages. So the role of actors, and I think that would be an important one to pay attention to in terms of states as key actors that are going to be right. enabling these linkages under the Paris Agreement carbon market. And, and that is something that people are talking about, state capacity being so important for those linkages. 
Um, just before Dan goes, I, I do want to say to our online folks, which we got a, a, a nice group of folks online, uh, please do use the hand, uh, the raise hand feature, uh, if, if you will, uh, in the reaction. That way we know that uh, you, you want to get in here. So, Dan Cole. Yeah, so I have a uh, great presentation, uh, John. I really appreciate it. A um, couple of questions uh, that sort of tie into my experience looking at the CDM program at the international level. and problems of additionality and so forth with, um, with offsets. You, one of the principal agent issues you raised was between the landowner and the validators. Do the landowners hire the validators? I mean, if that's the case, that, that presents you, I think, with a really interesting hypothesis to test, right? How much does that alone affect an overabundance of offset credits because the validator wants to be hired again right <laughs> and then my other question goes to uh leakage so what if there's a landowner in, in california that's selling offset credits but holds forests in other states as well couldn't the forests that they're conserving be offset by greater harvesting at other forests they own outside of California? Those are great questions. Thank you, Dan. Um, on the first one, the land, I'll pick up on the landowner verifier contract. The protocol requires project operators, in this case, landowners, to pick one of the approved and this is approved by the CARB verifiers, and they have to be an independent third-party verifier. And the, the list is not long. I, I have it, I think, in the supplemental material. There are a handful of verifiers out there. You raise a good point, um, but, but there is, these are repetitive interactions. So arguably, the landowner could switch from one verifier to another. Um, but there is a, a requirement that verification happens every six to 12 years for credits to be valid for transactions on the market. So that is a very interesting principal agent relationship that if I have a graduate student to work on, I think that would be a great <laughs> project mm -hmm. um, for them. In terms of leakage um, and system boundaries, there are two strategies that the protocol uses to address the, uh, concerns with carbon leakage. And one is deductions of credits at the point of transaction. So both the buyer and the, the seller would take off a portion uh, that accounts for that leakage. Um, they, they're basically deducted and allocated to the buffer account, which is an insurance, me insurance mechanism for potential like burning down the forest, cutting down the forest. The other well, component is the DEBS requirement, right? That only projects in California are going to be prior, prior, prioritized. You, you yeah, I, I, I just wanted to uh, ask a follow-up question on that one. Is California monitoring the activities of landowners outside the state of California to ensure <laughs> that they're not leaking? The only way they do that is through annual reporting. There's an offset project report that's submitted every year, and then the verification report every six to 12 years. But no, I mean, they, they do not send someone to physically walk the land. <laughs> um, go ahead. You want to ask no, go, please. Um, so I guess I have two. One is just a clarification question. If they do get caught, uh, in a leakage situation, uh, what's the penalty? And then the second is, uh, so your, your project is focusing on participation as an important aspect of off offsets. I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit about why participation or higher le levels of participation are particularly important for carbon offsets. Thank you so much. These are great questions. So the first one is a little more detailed about the penalties. Depends on what type of violation there is. So when we talk about the reversal or you know, carbon reversal, it could be driven by 
nature, right? Nat natural disturbance, wildfire, um, disease, uh, et cetera. And in those cases, the lost credits are compensated by uh, taking credits away from that common insurance mechanism known as the forest buffer account. And that is generated by deducting again, a percentage of offset credits at the time that the project is registered or issued credits to. And, but also you can think about a more intentional reversal, right? The forest owner goes on and cuts, cuts down a portion or the entire uh, forest acreage, uh, something that was brought up earlier. And in that case, there's uh, a penalty to pay. There's a financial penalty and also to compensate for the lost credits that have been already issued to that project. And that basically leads to the termination of the project, right? That's the end of it. There has been only one such occurrence so far. The other ones, and there are, I think, four or five of them have been due to wildfire. And so in those cases, uh, they have used a buffer account. In terms of the second question, the participation levels, why are they important? And I think this is a great question um, that I, I keep going back to. One of the arguments out there that I already brought up is the fact that we do need to uh, improve or increase the pace and scale of forest-based carbon removal as sort of a low-hanging fruit if we're serious about staying within the 2% uh, degree centigrade uh, global climate sort of uh, uh, temperature that, that, we are, that we are looking at. And we're probably going to surpass that anyway. But this is a low-hanging fruit. This is the climate mitigation argument. The other argument, and I'd like to hear more from Bernie or other foresters here, is that a lot of these forest owners out there, the small scale forest owners, and there's a significant number of them, they are facing difficulties with maintaining those important lands. We need to keep forests as forests and providing important revenue for them to be able to do that is critical. And one way to do that is through financing these forest offset projects in a way that makes sense to these forest owners, that is less costly and burdensome, but also matches with their goals for managing the land and passing on the land to their, to the next generation. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you so much. So, um, hi, very, very interesting uh, presentation. So, um, so I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I understood that the main idea was trying to explain different levels of participations across different types of, of, of participants or institutions. I was thinking that, um, so maybe part of the issue is that these uh, different participants, they have different goals, no? So if you're a land trust, uh, I don't know exactly, or we'll have lawyers in the room, they can uh, tell you more about that, but essentially, do they have uh, managers that are doing things on behalf of owners? Do they have some missions, some statutes that they say you have to go for some conserv conservationist uh, goal? Uh, so they, that could be maybe the reason different, different uh, actors are, are doing different things, while maybe private owners they are mainly preoccupied on maximizing the value of their assets, the private value of their assets. And that's, that's the reason. So it's not much about the design of the California board, it's about the differences in those, in those actors. Uh, and that's the reason you get different levels of participation, no? And then the, the other thing is, um, second question is, uh, I, I would expect that at the beginning they go for uh, kind of the, the, the cheapest alternative use, no? So essentially, first those guys that are, they have a forest that they essentially they can't do anything, they will try to go for this. And then suddenly you, you start entering kind of in the law of diminishing returns and entering and start competing with more valuable use. So there can also be differences in terms of that margin, in terms of different types of users, and that's give you different levels of participation. You nailed it. I cannot agree more with you. Um, Yes, different levels are driven by different motivations, different types of land use, different uh, sort of investment portfolios and management goals. And while this is important, I really do not 
touch on the differences in levels of participation by type of owner, right? So, and you see that for us in the industry, uh, the timber industry, land trust, the institutional invent investors, these are the timber investment management organizations out there. They were the, they're the big fish. And naturally they're the first to jump in on this opportunity and develop these projects. And they were successful projects. But I fail really to touch on the different levels of participation in the paper. So this is a good point that you're raising and something either to incorporate or think about focusing on as, as a separate project or separate paper. Thank you for that comment. Uh, okay. Can I have a quick follow-up? As a follow-up question? Yeah. That, or, is it, or I'm gonna, I can come back to you after Tom. Okay. Okay. Uh, Tom Coombs, go ahead. You're on mute still. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. Tatiana, great to see you and thanks for that presentation. It's lovely to be back in Bloomington virtually too. It looks like you have a nice day out there. Um, Tatiana, a couple of recent questions were about the participation, who does it? And I'm just wondering, um, economists talk, I, I guess, a lot about getting the pricing right, but a lot of times landowners care more about things like paperwork and ease of understanding the, the rules and also who they're gonna work with. Like who's the, who's the principal that they're in communication with. If it's the Environment Protection Agency, they're gonna say no, but if it's a DNR, they might say yes. So I was just curious if you've gotten any uh, insights at this point in your project about what these forest landowners are thinking in terms of um, who it is that they would rather work with uh, versus not work with, or which of the programs they, they like more, regardless of like the actual price, because it looks like it's very expensive, but it might not only be about their revenue streams. Thank you, Tom, and, and again, to echo that, good to see you, um, and thank you for being here. This is, this is a good point that you're raising, and we've been trying to get at some of that through other means. So we did a quick survey, very short, uh, not representative survey of landowners in Western North Carolina, and one of the questions was, you know, how willing are you, are you willing to participate, and under what conditions, and we asked, would you be willing to participate if the program is administered by a private, nonprofit, or a public entity. And so the two most preferred ones were the private and the nonprofit. And that is somewhat consistent and probably you can relate to in terms of the fairly, that there is a significant distrust among private forest owners uh, with respect to working with or you know, having the government as their principal. Right? The percentage of people who are working with federal state forestry programs and state foresters is fairly small. And so those are the people who have a fairly large acreage that are actively managing it um, and that are more likely to know about carbon programs and be interested in participating. But the majority do not know much about carbon programs. The National Woodland Honor Survey that Brett Butler out of University of Massachusetts administers every six years or so they're piloting a new one that's going to have a significant set of questions that, fall, that talk about carbon credits, carbon markets, and climate change attitudes. And they're doing that because what they found with the last one was there's 0.1% that even know or have heard about carbon programs. So first, I think it's awareness and knowledge. Second is the ease, but really what you nailed here and what you pointed out is who is the principal? Who are they going to be working with directly? And anecdotally, we've talked to people here in the region. They know about these big project developers out there, but they are hesitant to, to work with them. I just want to say, please remember to use the chat. I know Eric and Bernie have posted some good comments there. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to the room for a question, then jump online to, to Jamie. Okay, my question is, uh, I want to understand why you consider the, the conflict resolution as action situation while conflicts could occur during the, the um, participation implementation of during the process, you know? And I, I don't know why you consider it as, as part of really uh, action situation in the end, while, you know, the conflict could occur for, uh, during the marketing say, on sales or the verification or something like that. Thanks for this question. It conflict resolution or dispute resolution was lumped in with the rulemaking collective choice situation. Uh, 
And my thinking for doing that is that there are there have been legal challenges. And I cite one in the footnote to the paper where this is discussed, action situation five. There have been legal challenges in terms of California uh, linking or accepting um, offsets. Well, first of all, linking to other carbon markets like that in Quebec, um, in, in Canada, but also in terms of some of the interactions with federal and state forest um, or other environmental laws. So in terms of those legal challenges that the state of California had to address, I treat them as part of the collective choice situation where CARB and the state would be involved. But I welcome any suggestions or points that you may have in terms of how that may work differently or um, different ways to look at it. Jamie, you wanna jump in here? Sure. Um, actually, on that point of suggestions, um, I know sometimes we think of the state as participating in collective action, but part of the original idea of collection, collective action is in, in a commons, you know, without the insertion of a state, right? So how would that change your paper if you thought about it like that? Um, and so, so that's my initial question. Maybe, well, and if we have time, I can ask the others, but I'd love to know what you think. So to me, the collective action or the collective management of the resources, not as central um, because we're talking about land that's held by private individuals, managed uh, sort of under that, those sort of private ownership property rights. And so I treat most of the production process um, action situations one through four, and even the market exchange is operational level. Um, but there has, I mean, you raise a good point that there may have maybe collective act, collective choice decision making happening in terms of action situation for the market situation. Um, not so sure about the second and third, but certainly the fourth and the fifth could have components. Well, for the fifth I treat as collective choice. And partly because these are the high levels rules that guide the, the behavior at the operational level in terms of provision and production, but the market um, marketing, transacting of offsets, I think that's that's a good point. So Jamie, I'd like to, to continue that conversation if, if you have time. Thank you. Absolutely, I'm gonna, thank you. I wanna jump in with a question. And I, and I think, uh, well, this is kind of a comment and it may lead to a question, I can't tell yet. Um, but, um, you know, and my and thinking about this, I can sort of see how you got into this, or at least hypothesize how you got into this with your earlier work in land trusts and conservation easements. And so my question or thought goes a lot of, along the lines of what Bernie was talking about in, in the chat. But I'm, I'm curious what you see, if you see a role of like, say, the conservation easement literature um, feeding into like some early research on landowners in this to, uh, yeah, I, I think about the work that's been done with landowner decision-making on conservation easements that's, you know, you've done and Michael Drescher, who's who's online has done and and others. And so uh, that, that's sort of part of it. If, if you're conceptualizing land, like private landowners, 40 acres, 100 acres or 300 acres, not, I'm not talking about the big in, industrial force, like, like I think, is probably the four may fit into the, the four that you've noted here. So I don't know. I'm just wondering about that early or that land trust work and the easement work and if that's coming into play. So not directly. Thank you, James, for that. There is, uh, it's called Appalachian um, Forest Agreement or Appalachian Forest Group. Uh, it's based out in Tennessee. And what they did is a is an aggregation of Lent uh, that's held by conservancies and use that aggregation as one project to participate on the voluntary market. So there is the example of aggregating right individual properties under one uh, project and, and gaining that revenue to sustain the management of those lands. So conservation goals consistent with sort of the dynamics that and, and revenue that's uh, provided by the voluntary carbon markets out there. That's one example that I, I can think of that somewhat relates to your question, but we just don't know enough about the motivations and the knowledge and the awareness, right, of these smaller landowners in terms of how they're 
preferences for long-term conservation of the land might be consistent with participation and the requirements for participation under these programs. But that, that is a good, good way to link existing experiences on their conservation easements with, with these developing market uh, mechanisms. One thing I'll say, however, is that two of the North Carolina-based carbon offset projects that are earning credits on the California's program are conservation easement program, programs, uh, projects. And they're out in the east part of the state, you know, big sort of areas. And that relates to an earlier comment about management use. This swamps, right? They're, they're just, you can't grow anything, and but they're valuable for, for the services they provide. And they were one of the first uh, conservation, uh, forest conservation projects, avoided conversion is what they're called under the California program. I mean, just to follow up, it makes me think of Jake Brenner's early work asking those hypothetical questions about landowners and you know whether or not they would place an easement. But you could, if you wanted somebody wanted to survey conservation easement owners to ask hypothetically about carbon offset, you know, markets and credits. That would be a group that's already decided to put land in conservation in perpetuity. So you get past that threshold of you know what you're gonna what are you gonna do with a hundred year agreement? Those people already decided to to go well beyond a hundred years and and tie up their land. So. Different, different job, but I'll, I'll keep talking to you about it. It's interesting. Other questions? I have a two finger on that point, because I think one of the things that's really interesting there is, you know, so then you've got this perpetuity investment, right? But the question is then, you know, one of the things that you highlighted is the costs of investing in this, right? And so one thing that's interesting is that that strategy would allow you to separate the drivers there, right? One of which is about like sort of long-term conservation. And then to say, okay, so we've, we've already taken that off the table, to then really look at like, what is the role of cost specifically? How much would it need to be offset to really go from, um, you know, in, in, in sort of just being sort of willing to, uh, to be in these conservation agreements for, for however, whatever long time period to then sort of actually participating in these program, what, what exactly is the, the threshold hurdle there? And it would allow you to really separate the drivers there in a helpful way, it seems like. I know if you, so related question could could it be should I go first or go for it. so so specifically what kind of activities you can do with the forest that are not incompatible because essentially if I am allowing you to only do the forest as it is essentially the price that you have to pay would be exactly the same as buying the land because I'm I'm essentially eliminating any other alternative activity. So it would be the same. So I think it would be better off if you just have a phone to buy the land. So you need to keep, I think it's key in this type of, 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 of programs to keep some alternative activities open. So you only pay for a part, you know, otherwise just buy the land. If I can jump in here to that last point that, that you made, I, I believe Gustavo um, was the name I heard. And what, what you brought up is sort of the policy relevance here. How how are state uh, forestry departments responding to these changes that are happening in the marketplace? And we've been talking here to the Forest Service in North Carolina. There's a program called, it's basically a tax break or a tax incentive program, present use value. And I think there's a very similar one in Indiana. Um, and the question is, how can we make that compatible not so much with the California program. That's sort of, you know, we're not looking at it anymore. We know the problems with it. But these new programs that are coming up, the Family Forest Carbon Program by the Nature Conservancy is actually uh, launching a pilot uh, here in North Carolina. They're scheduled to do that this fall. And they reached out to the state as well to find out, so how do we decide on these set of practices that we are going to put in our protocol and say, you know, if you follow these practices, you get paid. Uh, and make sure that these practices are consistent with state programs that uh, people are already enrolled in. But under that tax incentive program, it's pretty much timber management, right? This is the predominant uh, goal. It has been the predominant objective of, of forestry, uh, forest assistance programs. And it requires timber harvesting every five years. But that timber harvest every five years might not be consistent with the management practices that would enhance or increase the carbon sequestration and storage by that, by that land. So there, there's a very interesting dynamic about 
Uh, and I think it's also level of decision making or administration because that program, the tax incentive program, yes, it's a state program, but it's administered at the local level. And a lot of the discre discretionary decision making and overseeing the program happens by the county offices and the capacity, the administrative capacity they have to do that sort of varies from county to county. But yep, this is a great new direction that, that this project can, can go into next. Other questions, uh, online or in, in person here? Well, I have a follow-up question. <laughs> My real question, <laughs> um, which was, <laughs> Which was a question about like that that sort of ties into some of the other questions that have been brought up about like costs and even the idea of hidden costs. And I just wonder, has anybody done calculations about like the benefits of these kinds of programs versus the administrative costs? And not just the administrative costs in terms of manpower, but let's say, I know this sounds crazy, but like the electricity it takes to, you know, run the databases and to keep this data current for 50 to 100 years, because it's, you know. I mean, we talk about electric and EV vehicles as being like good for the environment, but we forget that electricity is produced not just by, you know, solar panels and waterfalls, but like by coal and, and other sources. So, so there's like, these are complex calculations of costs. And I'm just wondering if someone has, has, has someone done that? Well, if anyone in the audience has, uh, you know, an answer for that, I'll, I'll be curious to hear it. <laughs> I don't know of any studies. Does anyone else? Nope, know not, not me. The question is cost of burden. Uh, there's a there's a pretty big management literature on red tape. Uh, the specific cost of electricity of the actual managerial practices would be uh, something that would go into capacity demands for a project. So. Well, I don't know if it's done on four specific, but there's a decent chunk of literature on that. My comment, my my own comment to the point that you raised, Jamie, is that, and I I do I do include that in the discussion of the paper is that there's a huge uncertainty, and it's both the biophysical, right, the sociological system uncertainty, uh, climate change, right, disturbing natural disturbance risks. But there's also that institutional uncertainty, right? We just don't know how long this program is going to be um, in place, right? Or will there be enough capacity to do the monitoring and the verification, right, et cetera? And there's so many uncertainties given the, the size and the diversity of actors that are involved that you know, you know, a decision maker, a private individual who's making these decisions their time scale and horizon is fairly limited, right? And that type of uncertainty doesn't really work with the choices that they're making. So I, I think that it's a fair point, um, but I work, I kind of address it or work around it in the context of uncertainty. Honestly, that would be a fascinating second paper, just the uncertainty that, that private individuals face in, in this particular context. Thank you so much. Well, Tatiana, we're kind of at, at the end of the time period here, so we're going to wrap things up. Thank you very much again. Really appreciate folks uh, being here, folks being online. We got a, a very international group, so uh, I, I think, thanks everyone. And um, I believe, you know, most importantly, the most important aspect, there's lunch for those here. Uh, apologies. Online, you only get virtual cookies. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. <laughs> drone things in. Um, but, That's uh, right. That's right. But yeah, there is. Uh, there are subs right out here. Thanks to thanks to David and Gary. <laughs> Tatiana, that was excellent. Thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Thank you, James. Um, and, and everybody in the audience, in person, virtually. Great ideas for, for next steps. And, and again, I appreciate your time and input. Hopefully you're able to make it up sometime this fall or maybe in the spring. Right. I will keep you posted. That's the goal. Uh, I've talked to Emily. We can reschedule. Good. Good. You're always welcome. Bye, Tatiana. Yes, I know. Bye, everyone. <laughs>